Class? Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, something called polarization. So we mentioned earlier that we can describe a light uh, wave just with the electric field. So, you know, for instance, if we have a wave that looks like this, where we plot the electric field, yeah, and if the wave is propagating to the right, you can tell at any point on this wave where the magnetic field is pointing using the right-hand rule. Uh, it's like, for example, like in this portion here, uh, the wave would be coming out of the board. So you can your fingers in direction of the electric field, curl towards the magnetic field, thumb points in the direction of the velocity. So, uh, We also have a relation between the magnitudes of the electric and magnetic fields. So, where the electric field is a speed of light times the magnetic field. So, uh, yeah, just knowing the electric field, you know the magnetic field as well, which is convenient because, you know, vectors are uh, kind of complicated enough to have a single wave that consists of two vectors that acted differently. That could complicate things. If we're talking about a nice simple wave in a vacuum, uh, not much going on here. So, uh, yeah, we can just describe it with the electric field. And remember that uh, waves carry energy. And the electric field, the energy density is proportional to the electric field squared. So that's going to come into play. Okay, so uh, we can describe this wave as having an orientation. So alternatively, if you look at a wave that's coming towards you, you know, you can look at the electric field, it can point in some particular direction. And so, uh, yeah, the wave has a direction, even though it's oscillating. But, uh, yeah, the electric field oscillates in one particular direction. Okay, now... Uh, Polarization, there are certain, um, mainly we talk about polarization when light passes through a transparent medium. Uh, now, there's other ways to polarize light. Uh, like one example, uh, if you look at your computer screen, now the light coming from computer screens, um, maybe different monitors or different screens work differently, but I've noticed that it's polarized, and I can tell because I have... Uh, polarized sunglasses. Uh, we'll talk about how they work later, but if you put on polarized sunglasses and look at the screen, if you turn your head at a certain angle, the screen seems to disappear, and that's because it's blocking the light. Um, but yeah, so that only works if the light is polarized to begin with. So there are various ways light can be polarized. But if we have a wave, um, yeah, let's talk about unpolarized light actually. Let's say we look at a light bulb, and you look at the waves coming towards you. There's a lot of them, and they're oriented randomly. So we could have these electric field lines, or these individual waves are all pointing in different directions. So if you pick out one random wave, it can be pointing in any direction. So this wave is propagating towards you, so the electric field is in the board somewhere, but the Direction is completely random. This is unpolarized light. Now, polarized light means that all the light would be oriented. You have a lot of waves uh, coming towards you, but they're all oriented in the same direction. So this is polarized light. And again, there's a lot of ways to polarize light. Uh, something from a normal incandescent light bulb, totally random. Uh, but uh, mainly we're gonna focus on polarizing light by sending it through some semi-transparent medium. We have these devices called a polarized sheet. And um, I forget when they were invented. I might have put it in the notes. Actually, I don't think I did. Yeah, There's not all that much in the notes. But, uh, yeah, I think they were invented with uh, 
they have these long organic molecules that uh, they put on this paper and stretch it. And so they, they form these long chains and electrons can move along these molecules. And so if you shine light, you know, light has an electric field. So say that this beam of light passes by an electron. That's going to cause the electron to go up and down. Or it starts out going the opposite direction of the electric field until it's a negative charge. But then when the electric field goes down, so anyways, this is going to be oscillating up and down as well. Uh, now, what if you shine light with uh, an electric field oriented in this direction? This electron cannot oscillate in that direction. It's confined to the molecule. And so it can only oscillate in one direction, and it can absorb these light waves. Uh, these kind of pass through without being affected. And so uh, it absorbs electric fields in, per in a particular direction. So that's what a polarizing sheet does. It, lights, it lets light pass through, but it absorbs that light if it's incident in a particular direction. So, uh, again, we don't really worry about the details of how this polarizing sheet works. But let's look at the effect of it. So let's say we have this polarizing sheet. Let's make it like a circular. Uh, circular sheet. And it has a characteristic direction. So let's say this direction here, say it lets light pass through in this particular direction. But it will not light, let pass, light pass through in any other direction. And so what happens, it, well, we have two questions we need to ask here. What if unpolarized light hits this sheet? And then what if polarized light hits the sheet? So again, we have unpolarized light, just look at a light bulb, that's typically unpolarized. So what happens if you have the sheet and hold it up to that light source? Uh, the other example is uh, if you have polarized light. So we're going to actually start out by assuming that we have polarized light hitting this sheet. It's kind of a backwards way of doing it. But answering this question will allow us to answer the next question, what if unpolarized light hits the sheet? So we're going to start with this uh, polarized light hitting the sheet. So the sheet will allow electric fields in this direction to pass through, but not in any perpendicular direction. But what if we have an arbitrary direction where there's an angle theta between the electric field and this characteristic, or this, uh, yeah, you can call it characteristic direction, or you know, whatever direction it's going to allow through. So how we can deal with this, as usual, let's break this electric field into components. So we have a component in the direction that's allowed through, and we have one that's perpendicular. Now this one here, it's adjacent to the angle, So this has a, uh, a component E cosine theta. Now, uh, what we want to know really is, um, we want to look at like the intensity of light that's passing through this polarizing sheet. So um, how much, let me define intensity. Uh, we use S for intensity. I think we use I for a lot of things, so kind of, I've seen this in other books, S is kind of a standard. Uh, this is measured in watts per square meter, so the intensity. And basically what it is, it's uh, like the energy or the uh, power per unit area. So let's say we have a surface here, and there's light incident upon the surface. We know that light carries energy. So like how much energy is hitting this surface uh, due to this light? Well, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how big the surface is, for instance. 
If our surface was twice as big, it would absorb twice as much light, so it would be twice as much energy delivered to it. Uh, it also depends on time. So the total energy, it depends on the area of the surface, uh, time. I'm also going to write orientation and then kind of ignore it. And what I mean by that is if we rotate this surface, uh, not as much light is going to hit it. So orientation can play a factor, but it's one we're going to ignore. It'd be very easy to deal with if we rotated this surface, we just have to look at the area like this area here, because that's what's actually being hit by this light. So, uh, but yeah, we're not going to have to worry about that one. It'd be easy to deal with if we did need to, but we're not going to. Uh, and then the light itself. Uh, the light, you can picture if you have a light bulb, and just look at the wall, how much light is hitting that wall. Well, if you replace that with a brighter light bulb, it'll, the wall is going to absorb more energy. So we're going to find the, uh, the property of the light itself is the intensity. And so we define intensity as power over area. So, and we do that because we want intensity to, be, intensity to be a property of the light itself and not what the light is actually hitting or how long it's hitting it. So power is energy over time. So, um, yeah, we, we're removing time for, from this uh, equation. And then we divide by the area to, you know, get rid of that as well. So we have units of watts per meter squared, and intensity is just a property of the light itself. Okay, so, um, yeah, we want to know, let me draw another picture of what we have here. So let's say we have our polarizing sheet looking at it from a different perspective, where here our light, we have polarized, light hitting the sheet, and let's say the intensity of this light is S0. It could be, you know, like say 50 watts per square meter, whatever. And we want to know what is the intensity of light that makes it through the sheet. So this is looking at it from a side view. Light hits the sheet, passes through. This is looking at it, if you were like standing over here looking at the light coming towards you, you can see the orientation of the light from this picture. So I figured I'd you know, just draw both of them. Now we know that the intensity is related to the power, which is related to the energy. So, uh, yeah, we can just, I'm just going to write down the equation. But uh, the energy depends on the electric field squared. And so multiplying by cosine theta, uh, cosine theta is less than 1. Unless theta equals 0 or 180. Uh, well, 180 is negative 1, but don't worry about that. But uh, yeah, if cosine of 0, then nothing is going to be blocked. If, the electric, if theta is 0, the electric field lines up with this characteristic direction, and the light just passes through without being bothered. But otherwise, theta is going to be less than 1. And so the, uh, the electric field is being reduced by this factor of cosine theta. And because the, the power depends on the electric field squared, so the intensity will depend on the electric field squared, uh, what gets through is going to be reduced by a factor of cosine squared theta. So this is our equation. This is called the Law of Malice. Uh, that was a guy who originally discovered it. His name was Malice. Now, it might seem kind of like a trivial thing. We know the intensity is proportional, or, yeah, proportional to the power, which is proportional to the electric field squared. 
So if we reduce the electric field by a factor of cosine theta, then the intensity will be reduced by a factor of cosine squared theta. So it's kind of a simple thing. You know, why is it even named after someone if it was so easy? Well, Malus discovered this, I think it was even in the 1600s. I'd have to look up the actual time, but uh, he discovered this long before we knew any of the things we're talking about here. They didn't even know light was a wave back then. So he observed this phenomena of polarization and was able to describe this relation experimentally. So it was a pretty big deal when he came up with it. Okay. So this is one rule that we have for dealing with light passing through a polarizing sheet. Uh, if we have polarized light hitting a sheet, its intensity is reduced by this factor. Or it's just given by this equation. Okay. Uh, now, we want to look at um, what about unpolarized light? So if we have completely unpolarized light, if the light is completely random, you know, how would you define an average? Like, how would you figure this out? Well, it can hit with any, let's just say we want to do it, let's say we look at one degree increments. Like, we look at how much it goes between zero and one degree. Like, how many rays go through that angle, they're going to reduce by this factor of, you know, cosine one degree. And then, like, two degrees or three degrees, you can look at like every degree increment and uh, just go through and calculate the effect of that cosine squared theta on each of those things and then take the average of all those values. Basically what we want to do is take the average of cosine squared theta. Now, um, defining the average of a function is actually a little bit beyond what we can do in this class, at least as far as a procedure for calculating averages. The idea is you have a function with an infinite number of points, you just sample a finite number of points and then treat it like a normal average. Like if you have a function defined between two points A and B, you can just break this up into say a hundred pieces and you can have like F1, F2 and so on. And so you take these values, you're sampling the function at a hundred points, add them up and divide by a hundred. So uh, yeah, that's basically what we do to define the average. That's a procedure we can do in this class. It's very time consuming. We're able to give, give a very precise definition of this. And I think we've talked about this before. Um, there's kind of a trick we can do. Uh, the average of cosine squared theta, if we go all the way around the circle, which we're doing here, because the light can hit it at any angle. So the average of cosine squared theta is equal to the average of sine squared theta. Again, just because sine and cosine are the exact same function, they're just offset. So if you go all the way around the circle, I think this is pretty clear that the, this is true. And so if we want the average of cosine squared theta, uh, we can say that uh, yeah, I mean, we can have cosine squared one half of cosine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. And then because these averages are equal, we we'll replace cosine squared theta with sine squared theta. And this is just one. Sine squared theta plus cosine squared, squared theta is one. So the average of cosine squared theta is one half. And again, I think we did that talking about the uh, RMS average. So uh, yeah, if you look at uh, like the alternating current EMF that's described by a sine or a cosine, and uh, we get these average uh, like one over root two things. So uh, yeah, we've done this before, but uh, the average value of cosine squared theta going all the way around the circle is one half. 
So, if you have unpolarized light, let me just write this down. So if unpolarized light hits a polarizing sheet, the intensity is going to be reduced by this factor of one half. So if you have, say, 50 watts per square meter here, then what's going to get through is 25 watts per square meter. Okay, so again, we've got these two cases. This is for unpolarized light. This is for polarized light. Now, um, but there's a little more to it than that because what happens when light passes through this polarizing filter, all the, the electric field is always going to be lined up with the characteristic direction of the polarizing filter. So in this case, whatever the orientation of the light was before it passed through this sheet, when it comes out, its electric field is going to be in this direction here. So whether it's polarized light oriented in this direction, unpolarized light, it doesn't matter. When it comes through, its electric field is oriented in that direction. So uh, this is a good way to create polarized light. So you reduce the intensity by a factor of one half, but then when the light gets through, it's polarized. Okay, yeah, they make polarized sunglasses uh, to kind of reduce the glare. And also, light can be naturally polarized, um, like reflecting off water is a big one. So if like light strikes water, uh, it can be polarized by reflections as well. And I think that's why they make polarized sunglasses. There's other ways of reducing glare, but this specifically blocks out that kind of light that would be like reflected off the ground and kind of directed towards your eyes. It kills off more of that light than other directions. So I'm pretty sure that's why they make polarized glasses um, instead of some other method of filtering that. But uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's actually stop here on the subject of polarization. Uh, but we'll do some examples in class. Um, but yeah, these are kind of the things, the rules, just know which one to use. And it's actually kind of obvious which one to use if you think about it. So if I say unpolarized light is hitting a surface, what would you possibly put in here for theta? Theta is the direction between the electric field and the characteristic direction. So if the electric field is random, you don't know what to put in for theta, you can't use this one. Okay, so we'll stop here um, and then just go over some examples in class.